Hello, everybody. Welcome to another live stream history by podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dennis McDonald, and today we're going to be discussing his new book, which is titled Synopsis of Epic Tragedy and the Gospels. And it contains three volumes in one book, the, the first volume being the mimetic synopsis of four synoptic gospels, and the second volume being the mimetic syncre syncresis of the Acts of the Apostles, volume three is the mimetic synopsis of the free gospels of john so what we got welcome back to history value podcast uh, th thank you jacob uh, it's a pleasure to be back i just want to explain those subtitles sure. of course most of your uh viewers will know that there are only three synoptic gospels but uh i add a reconstruction of the lost gospel q that i feel rather confident about and can compare it then with the other synoptics, synoptics. So maybe we can talk about that later. Uh, a synchrosis is not a synopsis. It simply is a comparison of the Acts of the Apostles with classical Greek literature. Now, also, almost all of your viewers are going to know there's only one Gospel of John. So how can you have a synopsis of the Gospel of John? Well, the way you do that is to tease out the three different compositional layers of the, comp of the Gospel of John that uh, scholars have disputed for a century. And I give an alternative teasing out of those layers, and I compare them with each other so one can actually see how the Gospel of John developed um, according to this conjectural reconstruction. I want to say one other thing. I am so pleased with this volume. It represents really 20 years of research. Nothing is going to surpass it in my lifetime, though I do want to say, Jacob, that there will be a sequel. Um, this book is a, um, a reference work. It is not an argument. But the argument's going to appear in another book called Mimesis and the Synoptic Problem. And I can uh, talk to your uh, viewers about what Mimesis is and what the Synoptic Problem is. But um, probably that's down the pike. Let's talk mostly about synopses of uh, epic tragedy in the Gospels. Yes, I would like that very much. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and start reading uh, some of those parallels. Uh, let me let me say one more thing, if I might, Jacob, before we do. Yeah. This book is 570 pages. It's available on Amazon right now for under $22. I dare you to find a scholarly work anywhere in any field that's available for $22 um, with 570 pages of argumentation. So uh, the, uh, Amazon, in its wisdom, dropped the price in order to tease people into purchasing. And this is the time to jump in because the price is going to be more than doubled uh, once this promotion is over. And so uh, this is your chance to, uh, to, to get a certain amount of enlightenment. Um, they also did a beautiful job in production. I don't know if you're um, comfortable with what you see on the cover and in the production of it, but for a paperback, it's really quite substantial. The paper is durable. They did a good job with the 23 images that appear in this text. Uh, almost all of them from classical Greek uh, vases and uh, statuary. And um, it, uh, it was a pleasure to write. One other thing I want to say, Jacob. Um, this is intended to be a reference work. So what I suggest is that when people buy the book, they simply see what it is in the first 20 pages. It's an alternative gospel synopsis in English 
that has every word of the New Testament Gospels placed in parallel columns when appropriate. But all of the, all of that, uh, every word of the uh, canonical Gospels is present. Most of the Acts of the Apostles is present. So what I would do, and really, I, I think this is important to do. I would read the first 20 pages and then dabble in the rest of the book to see what your interests are. So if you're interested in the Gospel of John, flip over there. If you're interested in the Acts of the Apostles and the Aeneid, flip over there. So what we're going to do, Jacob, as I understand it, is we're going to do that very thing. We're going to dabble into the book. We're going to read some parallels and um, see if that evokes some chatting um, on your website. But I think that's exactly the way to do it. It's more of an encyclopedia than it is a sustained argument. Mm -hmm. It's more of a reference work than an argument in a scholarly monograph. And I'm uh, perfectly happy with people who have it as a reference work against or with a Greek or other synopsis. Uh, use it for sermon preparation or for classroom teaching or for church school or whatever, and uh, j just sample it and uh, see what you think, because there are many ways of explaining the parallels we're going to be talking about. One can talk about it as oral tradition. One can talk about it as Greek culture and Hellenism influencing the early church. One can talk about it as accident so um, this work is intended to put the information out there that most people otherwise wouldn't have available to them. And that includes the Lost Gospel, it includes Homeric Epics, it includes Greek tragedy, it includes Platonic dialogues. Uh, and I don't expect everyone to read the book to be a classicist, but I expect them to, by the time that they're done reading the book, that they will be classicists, because this is marvelous literature. And the Gospels and Acts are written by people who are truly, for their time, intellectuals. That doesn't mean they're top grade, but it does mean that they're smart and that they've got access to texts that we usually don't think of. All right, let's get started. Um, I'm looking at page 101, in which you, uh, you're comparing Odyssey 2, 4, and 15 against Luke 4, 16, 30. I mean, with Luke 4, 16, 30. Yeah. So um, the way we've done this, Jacob, just so your viewers know, is that I'll read the left-hand column, and you'll read the right-hand column. Yeah. And, and then we'll reflect on it. Is that right? Yep. Okay, so I'm reading from um, various aspects of Odyssey 2, 4, and 15, and these have to do with Odysseus' son, Telemachus. Telemachus, empowered by his encounter with Athena, convened an assembly of neighbors to seek the liberation of his house from the suitors. Jesus, empowered by his baptism and the descent of the Spirit on him, preached at a synagogue in Nazareth, where he announced imminent liberation. Telemachus stood in the center of the assembly, and a herald put a staff in his hand. Jesus rose up to read and was given a book. Um, and there in the parallels, one can see similarities in Greek, actually. And all Pontus, the people, gazed at him when he arrived. Jesus was glorified by all after he read, to, read the text. The eyes of all in the synagogue were gazing at him. And the Greek in that text is Pontus, the same, uh, and also Ponton, the genitive plural. Telemachus boldly set forth his intentions of ousting the suitors and freeing his household. Jesus boldly set forth his mission to proclaim release to the captives. 
Helotherses, the prophet, reminded the suitors of his prophecy long ago that Odysseus would return and liberate his house, quote, and now all these things are being fulfilled, end quote. This writing, the prophecy of the prophet Isaiah, promising liberation, is fulfilled in your ears today. Telemachus tossed the staff to the ground. Jesus handed the scroll to the assistant. F everyone, Pontus again, was impressed by his eloquence. Everyone, Pontus, was impressed by his eloquence. Telemachus did not get what he had requested and alienated the suitors. Jesus told the assembly that no prophet is acceptable in his own homeland and gave as examples the ministries of Elijah and Elisha to Gentiles. As a result, he alienated everyone. The suitors laid in wait on a rocky island, that's a quotation, for Telemachus's return so that they could kill him away from the city. Jesus told the uh, assembly. Th sorry, sorry. Those in the synagogue. Pick, up, yeah. pick it up there. Those in the synagogue took Jesus outside the city on the brow of a mountain to kill him. Thanks to Athena, Telemachus escaped and sought to reclaim his father's kingdom. Jesus passed safely through the crowd and continued to proclaim the good news of his father's kingdom. And here's my comment. The density, sequence, and distinctiveness of these parallels surely qualify for mimesis. Those parallels are really quite astonishing, I think. And um, unfortunately, they've not been seen by other interpreters, as far as I know. Hmm. Yeah, the, um, the one that really caught my eye is the, is the Pontus, uh, Pontus being mentioned at the glorification. And mm -hmm. again, at the, at the impressed by his eloquence in what appears to be perfect parallels of the Odyssey. And the other is that it's the people who are impressed by him that then turn around and try to murder him. So yeah. uh, there, there's a, an irony in both stories. Definitely. In the next page, you're comparing the Logoi to the Odyssey. This is page 102. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, a uh, logo to the Odyssey. This is a bit strange. Logoi, for your viewers, is my reconstruction of the Q document. And I have alternative criteria for reconstructing Q. Now, for the story that we're going to read right now, People who are Q skeptics, and there are tons of them, and no doubt some of your viewers are among them, can just replace it with Mark's account of, um, uh, of Jesus' temptation and um, acquiring the, the, a crowd and a, a, you know disciples. So let's see how it works. Again, we're talking about Telemachus in the Odyssey. Odysseus is not mentioned as a character in the Odyssey until um, book five. So everything in books one to four, almost everything, pertains rather to Telemachus. So again, I'll do the Odyssey piece, but you're going to do either Q or for some of your less generous readers or auditors, you can do math, Mark. As Odysseus's son, Telemachus was the rightful heir of his father's estate. But the suitors were threatening his authority. When he returned from Sparta, he could not risk going to his house. Instead, he lived in the shack of his swineherd. As the son of God, Jesus was entitled to authority over the world. But he rejected this authority when the devil offered it. The son of man does not have anywhere he can lay his head. Yeah, that, um, that piece does not appear in Mark, but it appears in Matthew and Luke in the temptation stories. Empowered by Athena's affirmation of his sonship and encouraged to assert his authority, 
Telemachus challenged and threatened the suitors. Empowered by the private knowledge that he was God's son, Jesus returned to Galilee and bravely announced, Repent, the kingdom of God has arrived. So now he, like Telemachus, is bravely announcing a kingdom that is rightfully his. Telemus called an assembly of his neighbors and asked them to oust the suitors. Although they were stirred by his courage, they refused to help. At Nazara, his hometown, his neighbors were amazed at his wisdom. Even so, they were offended by him. Telemachus received no help from his neighbors, so he and Athena mentor, that Athena disguised as mentor, he had to sail off to consult Nestor and Menelaus about Odysseus's fate. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his own homeland. He then left for Capernaum by the sea. Yeah, the point is that at the hometown, both Telemachus and Jesus are rejected. Uh, Athena mentor provided a Telemachus a ship with the crew. At Capernaum, Jesus acquired followers. And in the Gospel of Mark, those followers are sailors. They're fishermen. Um, so that's Mark's version of the, the acquiring of disciples. So once again, it's difficult to dismiss these parallels altogether. Uh, but I want to say one other thing methodologically, Jacob, if I might. Sure. The way that scholars generally understand intertextuality among the Synoptic Gospels and Q is with the procedure that we call redaction. And it really is a very delicate and sophisticated methodology for comparing the wording in Greek with one text over another to determine whether there might be a relationship, what the relationship looks like, and so on. But the way the ancients worked was not simply scribal, it was also authorial. That is, they were not simply editing other literature, they were imitating it. And we need to enrich the entire discussion of gospel intertextuality by understanding literary creativity and not scribalism. And this is why mimesis is important. Mimesis includes redaction. That's another way of rewriting a source or a model. But the uh, uh, sophisticated Greeks were taught how to imitate literature more freely than scholars. Uh, we scholars are more anal, if we might put it that way. So uh, what we need to do is to refresh our understanding of synoptic intertextuality by understanding in terms of mimesis and not redaction. Now, if we were to look at these uh, two examples that we've had so far, and we were doing redaction criticism, we would say there probably isn't a connection between them. But now that we've done it with mimesis and a more literary freedom, we can see, oh, yeah, there might be a, a, a suggestive solution here. And um, so Jesus is playing a role of Telemachus, and in the end, he has to keep his um, identity a secret from the suitors, and in the end, he'll be successful as Telemachus and Odysseus were. So uh, this is one is capable of understanding these right on the surface of an English translation of Homer and uh, and the tragedians and the Gospels, and that's what uh, synopses of epic tragedy and the Gospels is attempting to do. Page one hundred three. Uh, this time you are uh, comparing Odyssey, the Odyssey to Mark. Yeah, okay. This yeah. is the Markan version of the acquiring of uh, disciples. The, I'm reading from Odyssey 2, right at the end of the book. 
Telemachus, because he because Telemachus had been rejected by those in his hometown of Ithaca, he needed to have some help from others in determining what happened to his father. Telemachus needed a boat and a crew to travel to the mainland to learn of his father. Jesus needed a boat and a crew to travel about the Sea of Galilee. Looking like Telemachus, Athena went throughout the city, approached every man, told her story, and asked them to gather at dusk by a swift ship. As he passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting nets into the sea. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishermen for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Then from Noemon, the illustrious son of Phronius, asked for, um, she asked for a ship, and he gladly pledged it to her. And going on a bit further, he saw Jacob, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat, repairing the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat. Um, later the men joined her at the ship with the hired men and went off after him. If one grants that Mark's version of the calling of the fishermen in this passage transforms the calling of followers in the lost gospel, the Methane and Lucan evangelists independently created what I call mimetic doublets by redacting both. Um, so <laughs> I don't know how far we want to get into the weeds, Jacob, about mimetic doublets and so on. It probably is better to save for another time uh, or for a careful reading of this, uh, this book. Mimetic doublets mean, simply means that sometimes gospel authors include two versions of a story, one of which they take rather woodenly from a source, and another one is they transform it because of mimesis of Greek poetry. Now, I can give some other examples of it, but uh, you must have more on your plate than, than that. In, in, the, in the very next page, you talk about the Homeric hymn to, to Dionysus to Luke 5, 8, 8 10. <clears throat> uh, we're looking at page 105. Yeah, that's, that's it, yeah. Um, would you hold up? No, I'm going to hold up a picture of the story we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. This is Dionysus aboard a ship, um, and he's turned some uh, pirates into uh, dolphins. And there are some 20 <coughs> images like this strewn throughout the book that demonstrate how popular these stories were. So, uh, yeah, let's give it a shot. Um, I actually think, if you don't mind, Jacob, it's better to start reading on page 104. Okay. And what I'm going to do is um, read my translation of the Homeric piece, the, the Homeric hymn to, Aphrodite, to Dionysus. And then we'll compare it with the, uh, the Gospel of Luke. The Homeric hymn to Dionysus begins like this. I will speak of Dionysus, son of Radiant Semele, how he appeared by the shore of the barren sea at a jutting headland, looking like a young man. That's it. He's in disguise. Soon men on a well-decked ship, Tyrrhenian pirates, quickly arrived over the glistening sea, and when they saw him, they nodded to each other and jumped out quickly, grabbing him at once. They put him aboard their ship, rejoicing at heart, for he appeared to be a god of God, a son of God nurtured kings. Um, my comment then the pirates roped his hands and feet, but to no avail. Translation The helmsman understood, immediately cried out to his comrades and said, Madmen, what god have you seized and bound up? He's not like mortal men, but like the gods who have Olympian homes. Soon they saw amazing feasts. First of all, throughout the swift black ship, wine. 
sweet to drink and aromatic, began to trickle, and there arose an odor of ambrosial, uh, an order ambrosial. Amazement overtook the soul sailors when they saw it. Again, me. When the pirates witnessed even more dangerous portents, they dove into the brine and, translation, became dolphins. But the god had mercy on the helmsman, restrained him, made him fortunate, and said to him, Take courage, good man. You have found favor in my heart. I am loud crying Dionysius. Now, Luke. Uh, Dionysus or uh, Dionysus. Similarly, in Luke 5, 4 to 10, sailors nod to each other while sailing and are astonished by a miracle at sea. One of them confesses to be a sinner and finding forgiveness. Compare especially the following. So now we can go to the parallels you mentioned. The helmsman understood He's not like mortal men, but like the gods. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Amazement overtook Pontus the sailors when they saw Ithontus hit. Astonishment overtook him and all Pontus. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Right who were with him at the catch of fish they handed in. Yeah, and what you read before, when Peter saw him, is idhon. It's the same verb as in the, the hymn. Dionysus said to him, Take courage, good man. You have found favor in my heart. I am loud crying Dionysus. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on, you will be catching people. Dionysus turned sailors into fish. Jesus turned sailors into fishermen for people, a slick synchrosis that is a comparison. Whereas Mark and Matthew narrate known miracles that could have caused the four fishermen to follow Jesus, Luke's makes up for it spectacularly thanks to an anonymous Greek poet. That's a good selection. Um, and this is just from the beginning of the book. We really haven't gotten out of, uh, you know, the, the first section of it. Do Luke and Matthew, when they copy Homer, same thing with Mark, do, do sometimes, do they copy Homer differently than each other? Or do they pretty much copy Homer in the same way? And or does, when, when the Gospels borrow from each other, do they rewrite the parallels differently? When they, in when they copy Homer, if you get my meaning, yeah. Let's back up a little bit. Um, Mark is in the Gospels the consummate mimesis expert. He's the one who um, portrays the death of Jesus like the death of Hector. Uh, Jesus um, sails the sea like Odysseus. There are great feasts. There's a visit to the netherworld. Yada yada. Or to, to, the, to the dead, which is like the visit to the, the netherworld. Um, Matthew does not imitate Homer, except maybe in one instance where he likely has recognized Homeric imitation in Mark and wanted to expand on it. That's the famous episode about the guards at the tomb that appears only in Matthew. Luke imitates the Homeric epics occasionally, but usually he's more into a redaction mode. That is, he's editing Mark or Q or Matthew, in my view, and is trying to give a different spin on the Jesus tradition. But when he comes to the Acts of the Apostles, he goes crazy with mimesis. And other scholars have recognized the literary sophistication of the Acts of the Apostles, but they seldom have emphasized um, mimesis of Greek poetry or Plato. And that's one of the things that the synopsis uh, attempts to do. Now, when Matthew and Luke imitate Mark, let's say, 
they do so in dramatically different ways. One is Matthew is much more conservative with Mark and probably is using the lost gospel cue to create uh, what I would call melded mimesis or redaction, where you have hybrids created by um, melding together information that's available in Mark with um, information that's available in Q, and I can give you some examples of it. Uh, Luke is more like other authors of antiquity, especially historians, who uses more of a scissors and a paste uh, way of dealing with material. So as opposed to creating hybrids or um, and merging information from Mark and Q, Luke is more interested in scissors and pasting it into his narrative. So this is one reason why, and probably the most important reason why scholars who are interested in Q trust Luke's sequence of um, materials and often say that it's more primitive than what one would find in Mark, in Matthew, because he's not interested in melding things, he's interested in scissors and pasting them. There are other things, of course, that differ uh, between Matthew and Luke that would probably take us too far into the weeds for tonight. But um, your question's a very good one. And in fact, there have been dissertations, multiple dissertations, on how Matthew and Luke differently use Mark or Q. Speaking on the primitivity in Luke, the uh, I know that uh, the Matthewian uh, posteriority scholars uh, that uh, postulate the MPH idea uh, that Matthew knew Luke and Mark, Luke knew Mark, will say that the Q sayings of Luke, or the so-called Q sayings of Luke being more primitive than Matthew's Q sayings more often, to them is evidence that Luke is earlier. What do you think about that? <laughs> there are so many problems with Matthew uh, primitive um, uh, posteriority that I really don't know where to begin, but I guess I'll have to because your question's a good one. Papias, writing around the year 110, knows three Greek Gospels. He knows something he calls a collection of Jesus' logia attributed to Mark. He knows two Greek translations of what he understands to be a Hebrew Matthew. One of those translations almost certainly is something similar to the Mark that has survived, a Matthew that has survived. The other Matthew is lost. Now, what does one do with that? Now, you can say um, that it's Q. You can say it's not Q, whatever. What you can't say is that it's Luke. He is not talking about Luke as an alternative translation of that text. And there are a number of uh, very technical reasons for arguing. So the first thing is the earliest external evidence we have of the Gospels doesn't know anything about Luke or John. So let's get that off the table. So people who have Matthean posteriority have to ignore Mark or incorporate an earlier Luke into that project. Another is that um, internally, when you take a look at what's going on, you'd have to say that if Matt's right, Matthew decided to get rid of the entire Acts of the Apostles. Oh, really? Now, why would that happen? The other is that you have um, business in Luke that would be very congenial to Matthew's um, theology that don't appear in Matthew. So uh, I just don't even think it is worth talking about, honestly. Um, that the, the the history of the, and by the way, the synopsis um, um, that we're talking about, my book, organizes these columns very intentionally, chronologically, and not canonically. Mark, uh, a Q, or Logoi of Jesus, 
Mark, Matthew, Luke, then Acts, and then the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John is written after Acts, by the way. So um, it's amazing to me that the Matthean posteriority has any traction whatsoever. But you are correct that they they do recognize that Luke often has reverse priority to Matthew. His material is often earlier. Why is it earlier? It's because he's using Q. He's not using Matthew, for pity's sakes. I'd like to go to page 253 to look at um, Mark and Parallels to Logoi. I'm still working on it here. Okay. It is well known that the Gospel of Mark, later imitated by Matthew and Luke, has what some have called the Markan or the Little Apocalypse. That is where Jesus is talking about things that happen in the future. And then that leads into um, the Last Supper, Gethsemane, and Trial. Now, there are many parallels between Mark's apocalypse and the Logoi of Jesus, or if you will, the Q document. And by the way, this has been recognized by scholars in Q research for a long time. I'm not the one to have discovered it. I've actually discovered them, and they pointed the way to this material. What is different is what happens after, for me, um, what happens after these predictions. Um, we have narratives that are really very interesting in terms of um, the, the logo of Jesus and also the Odyssey. So um, in the left column now, I'm going to read passages from the Logoi of Jesus that are spoken in Galilee. But Mark is going to have parallels that are spoken in Jerusalem. Now, why is it that they're spoken in Jerusalem and not Galilee? It's because Jesus dies in Jerusalem. And because he needs to make predictions about his return, some of which are going to happen before the Jewish war, some are going to happen after the Jewish war. So um, I think the first thing to, uh, I appreciate, Jacob, you're identifying these passages. Um, so remember, when I, when I talk, I'm talking about what Jesus is alleged to have said in Galilee by the author of the lost gospel. And Mark transplants them into Jerusalem to make them um, a, a relevant to the Jewish war. 722 in Logo of Jesus, Jesus threatens to destroy the temple. Mark 13, 1 to 2, prediction of the fall of the temple. 8, 11, 12, hearings before synagogues. 13, 9 to 11, hearings before authorities. That is, in, in, in Galilee, you go before the synagogues and you go before political authorities once you get to Judea. Um, there will be, will be betrayals by relatives. 13, 12 to 13, betrayals by relatives. One should not follow would-be saviors. Not following would-be saviors. Jesus will return with cosmic signs. Jesus will return with cosmic signs. One needs to judge the time from nature. Judging the time from nature. The Son of Man will come back before the completion of the mission to Israel. Jesus will come back before the end of this generation. And in fact, that will include a mission to Gentiles. Um, Torah will not pass away. Jesus' words will not pass away. 
No one knows the day or hour. No one knows what day or hour. It's like a master returning from a journey. That is, it's like Odysseus returning from the war. Like a master returning from a journey. And so Jesus is returning after his death to be victorious. Do you want to read the next parallels then? Yeah. Okay. So then here's what we find in the Last Supper, Gethsemane, and Trial as parallels to the Logo of Jesus, though these parallels also have parallels in the Odyssey. Woe to the enticer. Woe to the, uh, to the betrayer. There are temptations by the devil early on in Jesus' career. Gethsemane. Where the idea of the temptations is now transferred to the disciples. Jesus is not being tempted, but um, even though he has to face his death. Um, the, Jesus predicts in the law of Jesus, I will destroy the sanctuary. I will destroy the sanctuary. But that's on the lips of false teachers. It, the, it's not that Jesus said it. Jesus says in Logoi, you will not see me until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Mark 14, 62, you will see the Son of Man. You will see the Son of Man coming in power. So where in one case you don't, you won't see me till you see me come. When, then when the Son of Man comes in power, you'll, you'll be in trouble. Um, Jesus in Logoi instructs his disciples to turn the cheek. Mark 14, 65, Jesus punched in the mouth. And he doesn't retaliate. So um, you have these, these echoes between the two that are really quite fascinating. Now, this is a wonderful example, Jacob, of the difference between redaction and mimesis. These, some of these people would identify as mimetic. Um, Jesus's words will not pass away or the Torah will not pass away and so on. But others are looser, but it's the way that authors often antiquity wrote. They wrote more generously and creatively for their sources. So think of it this way. Redaction criticism is interested in sources and editing. A lot of these parallels are different from that. They have models and imitations. And the imitations often are um, hermeneutically significant. They matter. Now, why would an author do this? It's to reestablish the, um, the values of a community that the author values. So um, that, that is a good example of the difference between redaction and mimesis. Are the Gospels, um, when you look at them and you look at all of these uh, enormous parallels between Homer's works and the Gospels, um, are the Gospels most, do did, did they just mostly contain um, rewritten material from Homer with, um, uh, with quotations of the Old Testament and, and other Jewish ideas? But m what I'm asking you is, are are the Gospels, by a, by a majority of their material, the majority of their texts, are they just are they just mostly Homeric rewrites? No, they're not. Mm -hmm. But the many of the most memorable passages about mm -hmm. Jesus's life are they have Homeric imitations. We've mm -hmm. already seen one about um, the early calling of Telemachus, early calling of Jesus. We have. Um, the passion narrative is so important for Easter and um, for um, the Resurrection Sunday and so on. That has parallels in um, the death of Hector and in the uh, re return of Odysseus to, to his followers and showing his wounds that demonstrate that he is who we thought he was. You have uh, other examples in the uh, the Christian year of the nativity story is uh, is based on the Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, in my view. 
But most of the Gospels are not mimesis. They are not. They're not mimesis of Greek poetry. They have reflections on Jewish scriptures. There are uh, controversies with Pharisees. There are parables. There are predictions, some of which we've already looked at. And that's why it's important to have two keys for unlocking the synoptics. One key is mimesis. That gives one a sense of what the narratives are about and why these authors are trying to craft a mythology to support the ideology of their communities and their identity against others. On the other hand, they're also interested in rescuing from uh, the Hebrew Bible and from uh, the Logoi of Jesus, which is a Jewish document that uh, values Jesus. Um, and they're interested in wisdom and interpretation of Torah and ethics and prayer and the future and so on. So it, unfortunately, my work has been interpreted by mythicists, that is those who deny the historical Jesus altogether as evidence that Jesus never existed. Au contraire, these texts show that Jesus was significant to people because he was a historical uh, giant and um, was attempting to make Jewish law more compatible to uh, the margins of society. He's very much like Mahatma Gandhi, in my view, in trying to make Jew uh, British law uh, uh, more uh, tolerant and acceptable to uh, the Indian displaced uh, or um, Martin King. So it would be wrong, in my view, to use my work to say Jesus never existed. I never had intended that. In fact, the subtitle of my book, Mythologizing Jesus, is from Jewish teacher to epic hero. I think that's what happened. For Jesus to compete in the uh, Greco-Roman marketplace, he had to be able to walk on the water uh, as well as, as Hermes or Athena or Poseidon. Um, he also had to, uh, uh, to have a heroic death, somewhat like Hector and so on. But that is narrative window dressing on so much that's going on in the Gospels. And I appreciate that some of the texts that we've read together, Jacob, emphasize the, the Jewish or the non-mythological piece of Jesus, what the authors of the New Testament and the Q document considered to be Jesus's teachings. I'm not going to commit myself to any saying that comes from the historical Jesus. I'm not sure of anything about that. I do know that the, his, the earliest records we have of the historical Jesus makes him a champion of a, uh, a reinterpretation of Jewish law that makes it more acceptable to the socially marginal. And um, it, that, I think, is secure. And he probably must have, in my view, he must have done it under the rubric of the kingdom of God as an alternative way of understanding God's rule in the Jewish world. We have a super chat question from Renzo Rodriguez. Thank you for your super chat. R.G. Price. And uh, just to remind everybody, R.G. Price is not to be confused with Robert Price, different person. R.G. Price proves Mark is solely based on Jewish literature, not Greek classics. Who is right? Is very Kindle version of your book. I live in Peru. Um, that view... I'm not familiar with, but in my view, it is ridiculous. To say it's solely based on Jewish literature, not in Greek classics, let's compare these texts, bring them out, let's do battle, and let's see which ones are closer, let's say, to the, uh, the transfiguration story, the death of Jesus, and so on. So who's right? I don't know that I'm right. I know that that position is wrong. Now, is there a Kindle version of my book? No, there is not. And there can never can be because it includes so many gospel parallels. It runs way off the page of any that, that is, would be qualified for a Kindle version. But 
Mr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm doing a uh, series of 24 brief lectures um, in which we do comparisons of these uh, texts and one can have it available in an audio form. You can listen to it on your cell phone. So this work will never be in a Kindle version. It will never be in an audio book. It, it's just far too complex, complex and it needs to be visual. But it can be available in an audio version uh, or visual version with these uh, and I can give you that information of where to find it. It should be available sometime uh, still this winter. I'd like to go uh, over just a few more um, Homeric parallels with the, with the Gospels. Um, let's take a look at page 257. Okay. Yeah. So I, I want to go back to Mr. Rodriguez. Okay. I am so glad that some of these this information is available vig, um, on uh, social media, and I'm so gratified that people in uh, for for you South America or Asia or. Um, I have uh, people from India or China that uh, have uh, contacted me about this work. So I'm so gratified that there's some interest in this alternative way of understanding the Gospels. And by the way, I'm not, I'm an atheist, but I'm Christian identified. And I'm not against Christian religion. I'm just against Christian ignorance about their own texts. And that's why this book that we're talking about, um, <laughs> the synopses of epic tragedy in the Gospels, is intended to be a reference work. It's an intended for people in Peru, let's say. And by the way, it's only $22 in the book. You have to get it there, though. Um, but um, the, the, it's a reference work. So, you know, take a look, see what the parallels are, as we're doing with Jacob, and make your own judgment. But to say that Mark is simply redoing Jewish literature is, in my view, almost intentionally ignorant of Greek literature. Okay, we're looking at page 257. Yeah. Oh, this is a fantastic example. Um, it's one of my favorites. And in fact, this was recognized by Byzantine intellectuals uh, that Jesus is going into Jerusalem um, has parallels in uh, Odysseus going into the city of the Phiakians. And in fact, when they retold the story, the gospel story, they used lines from uh, this part of the Odyssey to do so. So that, that's a... a a really good indication that in the history of interpretation of these texts, people who knew Homer saw the similarities. Okay, we're going to, I'll read from Odyssey 6 and 7. Odysseus has just suffered a shipwreck in book 5. He's found at the uh, beach by Nausicaa, who is the princess of the uh, Phiakians. And he needs to find hospitality in the city in order for the Phiakians, famous sailors, to send him home. Odysseus arrived on the island of the Phiakians entirely bereft. Mark 11, 1 to 14. Jesus arrived in Judea without money or a boat. Athena told Nausicaa to ask her father for mules and a wagon. Jesus told two of his disciples to find a colt and bring it to him. Nausicaa told her father she needed a wagon to do her wash. The disciples told those with the, with the colt, the Lord has need of it. Her father granted Nausicaa the mules. The owners allowed them to take it. 
She folded the clothes, the emata, and put them on the beautiful wagon, yoked the strong hooved mules, and mounted herself. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their clothes over it, and he sat on it. And that is a, uh, a, a koine equivalent to im, imata, it's imatia. Um, Nausicaa's mule cart led the way, then came Odysseus on foot, hidden among the slave women. Some of those escorting Jesus into Jerusalem walked ahead and others behind. Odysseus traveled through the fields. Some in the crowd brought branches cut from the fields. Odysseus, though a king, entered the city wearing someone else's clothing behind a mule wagon carrying laundry. Jesus, though the Son of God, entered the city humbly, riding on someone else's beast of burden with clothing for a saddle. Now, Sika viewed Odysseus's um, uh, opponent uh, uh, appearance as the will of the gods. Phiakians entered, he esteemed him as a god. The crowd shouted, Blessed is the one who comes in the, in the name of the Lord. He entered the city late in the day. On entering the temple late in the day. Um, Odysseus just stood there gawking, and when he had gawked at everything, Panta, <coughs> Jesus looked around at everything. And it's again Panta. Among the marvels was the garden of Elkinous with its fig trees that bore even out of season, fig after fig. Sicon de epi sico. The next day he cursed a fig tree for bearing no fruit, even though it was not the season for figs. And the words there are sikin and sikon. So um, you have actual verbal similarities between them. And as I said, uh, Byzantine poets saw the similarities and used lines from uh, Odyssey 6 and 7 to talk about the triumphal entry. Let's now go to page 264. You have another uh, list of parallels between the Odyssey and Mark again. 264? Yeah. Um, this is the famous parable of the, um, um, the wicked tenants. And um, what I'm going to read on the left-hand side doesn't have a parallel to one particular passage in the Odyssey. Right. It rather has to do with the narrative arc of much of the Odyssey. And um, so here we go. Odysseus built his house, put his slaves in charge, and went off to fight in Troy. Mark 12, 1 to 3 and 5, 9. 5 to 9. A man planted a vineyard, placed a hedge around it, dug a wine vat, built a tower, hired it out to tenant farmers, and traveled from home. Okay, so both men go on a journey after putting servants in charge and after having built something. The suitors abused the master's slaves and ate from the estate as though it were their own. At the appropriate time, he went, excuse me, he sent a slave to the tenants to receive from them some of the vineyard. After seizing and beating him, they sent him away empty-handed. He sent yet another slave whom they killed. Telemachus, the beloved son, and that's a quotation, Agapetus uh, uh, Pes, uh, sought to regain his authority over the estate. He had one more option, a beloved son. He sent him to them, last of all, saying, they will treat my son with respect. Antinous, son of, this is a quotation, Antinous, son of Eupithes, spoke among them, let us here and now devise a miserable death for him. Let's get the jump on him by seizing him in the field far from the city or on the road. Let's take possession of his property and his goods. Those tenant farmers said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. 
and the inheritance will be ours. And go ahead, one more. They seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. Odysseus returned, destroyed the suitors, and rewarded his faithful slaves. What will the master of the vineyard do? He will come, destroy the farmers, and give the vineyard to others. Now, Jacob, you will not find these parallels in any publication by another scholar. And yet they are so obvious to me and so important. Now, um, let's take a breath here, Jacob, and see where we are in our discussion. We've been at this for about an hour, and we could read more parallels. In fact, <laughs> the book has 570 pages, so we have a lot of parallels to look at. And I've been talking a lot. I would like to reverse it and ask you a few questions. Sure. And um, maybe we can tease something out of the chat. Um, what interests you about this way of reading the Gospels? Maybe nothing. I mean, I'm not asking you to... to uh, uh, endorse my book, uh, but uh, what can this, why does this matter? Well, I think it matters because it, it, it helps readers such as myself understand exactly where the Gospels got at least some of their information from, some of their ideas, some of their inspirations, and how they created their, their stories, understanding how they used their sources. And that's what I want to do. I want to understand why they wrote the way they wrote, how they view Jesus, how they're how they are remaking Jesus. Does this give you an exalted understanding of who these authors were, or does it demean them? I think it, I think it's the former. It gives them. I think it gives me exalted understanding regarding these authors. Absolutely. Now, these are not the greatest authors in the, uh, <laughs> the, the Hellenistic or Roman world by any means. But for their community, they are intellectuals. And they're attempting to craft narrative in such a way to help their communities manage the crises that early Christians faced, especially after the Jewish war. And uh, I have tremendous respect for these authors. I would like to think of my, if I were to write my own epitaph, it would be um, Dennis MacDonald, an atheist who helped save the Christian church. Uh, now that sounds really, you know, so arrogant that I, I'm going to regret having said it and so on. But I'm not against um, Christian religion. I live, I, I taught in a Christian seminary. I live in a, in a community that has lots of missionaries. And uh, religious people of every religion have done wonderful things. And they've also done awful things. So let's make religion better. I'm a musician. And I have uh, high standards for music, I think. But I, there's good music and bad music. We're not going to get rid of music, but we can make it music better. We're not going to get rid of religion, but we can make it better. We can make it more wholesome. We can understand it better. We can have these texts and not um, use them to deny what we know from science, which is one of the great challenges of um, the, the modern cultural wars. Let's go over a couple of more parallels. Um, page 280. Comparing uh, Odyssey 10 to Mark 14. <laughs> yeah, this is this is another good one. Hmm. Odysseus has spent a year 
sleeping in Circe's bed and e eating with her um, uh, uh, her female servants and their his crew have been enjoying themselves on the island too. But um, now he wants to get home. And um, so he has a final night with Circe. And she says, uh, hey, bub, before you get home, you're going to have to consult with Tiresias, the blind seer in Hades. You've got to go to Hades and get him out of, out of Hades and ask him how to get home and what's at stake and so on. And, uh, and then you'll, you'll be able to do that. So Jesus, after a meal at night, has a, a, a prayer to his father in which he knows that he has to go and die. And uh, soon after that, he goes to his cross. So here's what we have. Odyssey, book 10. Circe provided Odysseus and his crew a bountiful meal, including wine. Jesus and his disciples observed the Passover, including wine. After the meal, while his crew slept, Odysseus spent the night with Circe, asking her to send him on his way. After the meal... While his disciples slept, Jesus spent evening time in prayer, asking for the cup to pass from him. These is death. Odysseus learned that he must go to Hades. He despaired of life. Even so, he resigned himself to his fate. Jesus knew that he had to die and was distressed unto death. Even so, he resigned himself to his fate. Odysseus came into uh, came to his sleeping crew and woke them. Now stop sleeping, though sunk in sweet sleep. Let's go. Jesus came to his sleeping disciples and woke them. Are you going to sleep from now on and take your rest? Enough. Arise. Let's go. There was a man, Elpenor, the youngest, not particularly brave in battle. He fell to his death and his soul fled to Hades. A certain young man was following him, who ran when the authorities arrested Jesus. Odysseus left to consult dead Tiresias. Jesus left for his trial and execution. Now, if your viewers would like to see a picture of the naked young man, this is El Penor, as depicted on a Greek vase, uh, 500 B.C. or so. Um, and so people have wondered who's this young man who's fleeing naked? Well, it's El Penor. Wow. So he was the naked man all along. Uh, it, it, put this way, there's no historical character we're talking about, Jacob. We're talking about a literary feature. And this naked young man um, flees at Jesus's arrest, but he's the one who then reappears in Jesus's tomb to give um, a witness to the resurrection. In the Odyssey, the uh, El Penor character dies, goes, <coughs> but he can't get into the netherworld until his body is buried, and so he reappears in Book Twelve um, to, to for his burial and then is uh, allowed to be in Hades. It's, it's a trope that was well uh, worked in uh, Greek antiquity. Uh, we have uh, two or three versions of it in Virgil's Aeneid, as a matter of fact, with Palinurus and Mecenas, um, uh, and Caietus, actually, perhaps. So um, it's, a, it's a popular story. I think looking at these final two parallels, or I meant three parallels, will be a fitting conclusion to this stream. Pages 416 and 417. Okay, I am going to insist that these be the last ones that we talk about, um, but that doesn't yeah. mean we, can, we have to shut off the discussion if you have right. people who want to chat. So what are these pages? Yeah. 416 to 417. 
so now we're talking about um, the Acts of the Apostles, right? right. Yep. Um, this actually is a good segue because here we have the um, Elpenor character again, but now in the form of um, Eutychus, whose name means lucky. I'm reading from Odyssey uh, 10 to 12. These are thematic. They're not um, quotations. Odysseus and crew left Troy and sailed back to Achaia. Is hey, uh, Paul and crew stopped at Troyus, having left Achaia to sail back to Jerusalem. There's a narration in the first person plural. Narration in first person plural. After a storm, the crew and Odysseus ate a meal. After a sojourn, the believers and Paul ate a meal. Disaster came at midnight. Disaster came at midnight. The crew slept in Circe's darkened halls. There were plenty of lamps in the upper room. Elpenor fell into sweet sleep. Eutychus fell into a deep sleep. The narrator switches to third person. There was one Elpenor, the youngest. The narrator switches to third person, a certain young man named Eutychus. Elpenor fell from the roof. Eutychus fell from the third story. Elpenor's soul went to Hades. Eutychus' soul remained in him. Associates fetched the, bo the body dead. Associates took up the body alive. Elpenor was not buried until dawn. Eutychus was not raised alive until dawn. Elpenor was buried at dawn. Eutychus returned to life at dawn. Homer called the young sailor unlucky, the victim of an evil doom of a demon. He had survived the Trojan War, the Stragonians, Polyphemus, and Circe, only to stumble, uh, stumble off the edge of a roof to his death. The name Eutychus, however, means lucky. That can't be accidental to have a, a significant name like that. Right. To, um, final question. Do you think that... Do you locate the majority of the parallels that you do see w between the Gospels and Homer in Mark and Luke and not so much in Matthew based on uh, what you've uh, said in this dream? Oh, there, absolutely. Um, and in fact, the Gospel of John imitates the Euripides Bacchae, but not Homer directly. I don't see any Homeric influence directly on the Gospel of John. But uh, it's the, the Dionysian materials all over the place in John, as other people, by the way, have recognized. Um, so uh, Mark is the one who begins this mimetic project of imitating Greek poetry. Um, Matthew manages it by including it and by having one of his one imitation of his own, it would appear. Luke borrows many of Mark's um, uh, imitations, but for the passion narrative, he would prefer to show Jesus to be Socrates-like. And other scholars have recognized the influence of the, the Socratic dialogues. When it comes to the Acts of the Apostles, one example we've already seen with the Eutychus story, the imitations just explode. They're all over the place. Um, so, yes, uh, Mark is the most important Homeric imitator um, in the Gospels, but Luke um, probably has altogether more uh, simply because uh, he also added the Acts of the Apostles. We got a couple of super chat questions. Let's start with Malcion. Lysium, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Thank you for your, thank you for your super chat. What is your view of the fate of the body of Jesus? If no historical Joseph Arimathea, thank you, Jacob and Dennis. Happy New Year to both of you. Happy New Year's back to you. I think the mo uh, I think the most responsible thing that I can say 
uh, comes not from the Gospels, but it comes from Paul. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says that Jesus was buried. It doesn't say that he rose from the dead physically and created an empty tomb. He does say that after that, people saw him. And in fact, in Paul's view, um, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's what he says later in the same chapter. It, it rather is that the body of Jesus was somehow transformed so that it could make appearances to Jesus' followers afterwards. Now, I take that to mean that Jesus' body deteriorated in a tomb. Now, we know that sometimes people who were crucified were, in fact, buried. Um, we have evidence of that in Josephus. But we also know that more often than not, people were, who were crucified were left on the cross to be devoured by birds and dogs and to be desiccated by the sun. So, but I think in this case, probably um, there may not have been a Joseph of Arimathea, but there may have, there must have been somebody to bury Jesus. And that's the tradition that Paul knows. And I don't see any reason to challenge it. Renzo Rodriguez again, thank you for your super chat. Do you think Marcion was the author of the first gospel? Absolutely impossible. Now, yeah, the, to and I can give you the arguments, uh, Renzo, for that. And by the way, the discovery of Marcion's gospel by scholars recently is a very important scholarly accomplishment. And I um, reward it. Uh, and I think it's important. It's more likely, however, that Marcion's gospel is a truncation or a reduction of the canonical um, gospel. And I actually discuss that in this book it, it, it rather extensively and give evidence for it. The other piece of the, um, of the Marcion's gospel, though, is that it may, be, and this is Jason Badoon's read on it, um, Marcion's gospel may have been part of a very primitive um, um, gospel collection that didn't include the gospel, other gospels other than a truncation of Luke and um, the, the, some letters of Paul. And so uh, Jason's point is that may be considered the earliest um, New Testament of all. Now, I have problems with that hypothesis, too. But to say that Marcion's gospel was the earliest gospel of all just flies in the face of so many problems. Um, again, it's hard to know where to begin. Again, I would talk about Papias. Papias doesn't know anything about Luke. He knows two Matthews and a Mark. And I think that has to be taken seriously. Well, thanks for joining me today, Dr. McDonald. Okay, well, thank you for having me, Jacob. I wish you and everyone who's watching this a uh, Happy New Year. I wish you and everyone else watching this Happy New Year, too. And for those that don't know, Dennis's book is in the description below, a link to his Amazon, to the Amazon page to purchase this book. While it's still on sale now, it is available below. So go check it out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.